All right, welcome back. Our fourth panel, you guys are the survivors. You made it all day. Uh, so this is our fourth panel on uh, energy coverage in the media. It's a smaller panel, which means more time with each of the speakers. And very, very lucky to have as moderator, Evan Smith. So it's a real honor to have him. I'll introduce him in just a second. Quick administrative comment. After this panel, there'll be a couple more closing comments, and then we'll release you to the reception in the courtyard. So we hope you can stick around for the reception as well. A lot of people have been asking about the videos and the slides. We plan to make the slides available, but some of the slides will not be available in complete form. We'll have to remove a few here and there based on permissions from the speakers. And we'll try to make those available in the videos at some point later after some editing. And we'll send an email to everyone who's registered for the conference and all the participants so you can have access to this information later. So we'll make that available to you at some point later, but it won't be till January, I guarantee it. It's not gonna happen tomorrow. Uh, for a whole variety of reasons. So that's coming, and we'll just keep you posted for those who registered. If you are not registered and you're here anyway, you owe us $55, uh, or get us your email. We'll figure out a way to keep you posted. So this topic, uh, we'll let Evan Smith moderate. He is everywhere in media in a variety of capacities. He's a, a real leader and has been an editor and a publisher. He's done a variety of things. He was at Texas Monthly for a long time, won all sorts of awards there. Now at Texas Tribune, which is revolutionizing the, the model of media, and also has a TV show, and is just a really talented thinker, speaker, writer, moderator, so it's a real pleasure to have him. And he's got a party of 200 people or something at his house at 5.30, so I can't believe we got him here today. And by the way, it's not us. We're not invited to his party, just so you know. <laughs> exactly we have a, right. Don't you show up. Yeah, a different party. Anyway, so uh, please help me welcome Evan Smith. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Weber, thank you. He has a lifetime pass, only for him when I do this. And uh, to, to all of you, welcome. Those of you who are not from Austin especially, welcome. But please leave when you're done with this conference. If you, uh, <laughs> if, if you know anything about Austin, we like when people come. We also like when they leave. And so we're ha happy to have you here for the time you're here. I'm honored to be up uh, on this stage with a distinguished group of uh, journalists, uh, uh, some uh, from this country and some uh, one, not, um, uh, to talk about the issue of coverage of energy issues, climate issues in the press. They're going to each uh, spend about nine or ten minutes uh, making remarks. We'll have some conversation among the five of us and then open it up for questions, and I think it will be a robust discussion most definitely. Let me introduce them from my immediate left all the way down the panel. I'm, we're uh, lucky to be joined by Russell Gold, who is senior member of the Wall Street Journal's Global Energy Team, reporting on energy, oil and gas, and renewables. Based here in Austin, he's covered all major energy stories of the past decade, from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill to the rising importance of Wall Street commodity trading desks. In fact, his coverage of the Gulf spill was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His first book about fracking and U.S. energy will be published by Simon & Schuster in late 2013 or early 2014. On his left is Clifford Krauss, who reports on energy as a Houston-based national business correspondent for the New York Times. In 22 years of the paper, he's also covered the State Department, Congress, and the New York City Police Department, and has served as bureau chief in both Buenos Aires and Toronto. Previously, he was a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and the Edward R. Murrow Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. On his left is Carl de Meyer, the New York correspondent for Le Seco, the leading financial newspaper in France covering US politics and social and economic issues. Previously, he served as the paper's Berlin correspondent, its EU correspondent, and as a Paris-based staff writer. Before joining the staff of Le Seco in 2000, he wrote for the economic monthly magazine L'Expansion, the financial newspaper La Tribune, and the weekly magazine Le European. And that is the extent of my pronunciation of French words for today. <laughs> and then prior to that, David Sassoon, uh, to, to uh, cross left is David Sassoon, the publisher of Inside Climate News, the wonderful Inside Climate News, a nonprofit, nonpartisan news organization that covers clean energy, carbon energy, nuclear energy, and environmental science. Inside Climate News began as David's personal blog in 2007 and evolved into the great and robust publication it is today. Based in New York, David's been a writer and editor for a quarter century, focused on issues in the public interest, including human rights, cultural preservation, health care, education, and the environment. Please join me in welcoming Russell, Clifford, Carl, and David. Let Russell go first. We're going to just go one at a time up here from the lectern, and they'll have some opening remarks, and then we'll begin with questions. Well, Cliff and I have been competitors for the national newspapers for about six years, so I wanted to take this opportunity, because I don't think we've ever been on a panel before, uh, to correct something that was said earlier. Um, during the, uh, the <laughs> Scott Tinker presentation, he uh, attributed uh, the, the emergence of fracking with a K to the New York Times. So I looked it up. And it turns out the New York Times um, first mentioned a new story in 2010. The Wall Street Journal had him beat. We first mentioned it in 2006, but. 2010? 2010. 
But fracking with a K, we were both beat by the San Francisco Chronicle in 2004, and the entire newspaper industry was beat by Battlestar Galactica in the late 1970s, which pioneered the word fracking. <clears throat> so I don't take much uh, great pride in that. Um, you know, I just wanted to start off, I've been covering fracking in one form or another and, and natural gas and energy since 2003 when I went on my first tour of the Barnett. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I, I've been thinking about recently is why did this all happen in the United States? Why is it that this technology really emerged in the United States? Because it's a pretty interesting story. And if you were here for the first panel, you heard some of the reason private ownership of mineral rights, very important. Entrepreneurialism in the United States, also very important. But I think there's one more, I want to posit one more reason, and that's that the United States is incredibly lucky, geographically speaking. Most continents, you have your mountains in the middle, and then coastal plains going off to the side. The United States has two big mountain chains, Appalachia in the east and the Rockies in the west. And everything in between, a little while ago, was a giant inland sea. And the geologists here will, will correct me if I'm wrong, but the, from what I understand is that that giant inland sea, the marine deposits were crucially important to creating big, large, contiguous amounts of shale. And so, you know, it, it's just sort of interesting um, that the uh, you know, United States, which always prides itself, and I'm, I'm kind of making this point since this is U.S. and France, prides itself on exceptionalism, exceptionalism just got lucky on this one. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the media and coverage of energy and in particular natural gas um, because this is really a very big important story. A number of people have come up here today and have talked about revolutionary change, um, how manufacturing is coming back in the United States because of low gas prices. And, and it's really, it is a really big important story and it's very difficult to wrap our arms around because it's, it's probably the first story I've ever covered which just has so many tentacles and dimensions that sometimes it's, it's, it's tough, frankly, to, to figure out each way it goes. I, I wanted to highlight a couple things that I think the media has gotten right about this story. Um, I think we, and I'm not just talking about the Wall Street Journal, but, but you know, mass media in general, um, we, ID, we identified this early. There were stories going back to 2005, 2006, starting to talk about there's something going on ha out here in Fort Worth. This is interesting. This is, this is newsworthy. Um, we couldn't quite figure out what the wording was, what the terminology was. Was this unconventional? Was it shale? You know, was this hydrofracking or fracking? Fracking with a K, fracking with a C. But I, but I do think we, we did a, a fairly good job just identifying that there was something big and important going on, even if at the time we didn't realize the full implications. No one did. So what didn't we do quite as well, and, and where, frankly, is there work remaining for the media to do? Um, first of all, I think the print media, at least, uh, lost control of the narrative of the story very quickly. Uh, when I cover the Deepwater Horizon, I've said I think the most important thing that happened in the media with the Deepwater Horizon is when uh, congressmen forced BP to put a live video feed on the gusher in the Gulf, and all of a sudden on CNN and all the 24-hour the, the, the cable channels, every time you turned it on, you didn't know what you were seeing, but you saw something gushing out of something down the bottom of your screen, and that really changed the narrative. And likewise, in this story, um, when the video media, visual media, got a hold of it, and I'm in particular thinking of Gasland, that captured the imagination and captured the narrative. And all of a sudden, we had the flaming faucets, and everyone at parties, when they found out what I did, wanted to ask me about flaming faucets. Um, Something else that I think we could do better on is, is connecting this all with climate change. I think we're all still trying to struggle and understand exactly what role natural gas production has, what the impact is on coal, how that's impacting climate change, what about how much methane is being released uh, during the drilling of this. Um, I also think we focused a little too much on price and not on production. You know, we're, we're sort of, sometimes we cover natural gas and gasoline prices, is it up, is it down? Um, and we could just do a little bit more describing what, how is it that we get uh, this energy out of the ground? Because the United States is the number one per capita user of energy in the world. There's no question about that. It's been, been that way for, for a very long time. And, and frankly, the um, Americans are, are kind of willfully ignorant about where all this energy comes from. We don't think about it too much. Until a couple weeks ago when we had Hurricane Sandy come in, and when was the last time anyone went to a gas station and couldn't get gasoline, you know, it was out of gasoline? Uh, it just didn't happen. You'd have to go back uh, over a generation. Um, and, and that long period of time is sort of just kind of 
lulled us all into not really thinking about energy. And I think we could have done a better job writing about where does this energy come from um, and, 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 and can continue to do that. Um, and so, you know, so the, this really, this, this sort of new narrative really began to emerge about what is fracking and how bad is it when uh, the Marcellus really started taking off in Pennsylvania. And I think the reason for that is, I, I've thought about this a lot in my sense, and others may disagree, but when it comes to energy, the United States really is two countries. There's the middle of the, the country, which is, uh, produces a lot of energy, the Gulf Coast, mid-continent, and add in Alaska to that, obviously, in the Rockies. And then there are big parts of the country which don't generate a lot of energy, but they consume a lot of it, and they don't think about that. And there's a sort of this long relationship which has developed, the East Coast and the West Coast sort of takes energy in the middle of the country makes energy. And then when that started to change, and all of a sudden in Pennsylvania, and possibly in New York and Ohio, we had large energy production starting to take root, I'm not sure that people up there really fully understood what was going on, what were the implications, what did this mean, was it good, was it bad? And that's when I think the media could have done a little better job of trying to get out in front of that and writing about what it all was and what it really meant. Not to say it's good or it's bad, but just to give people a little more information about what was happening. Um, and that opened the door for a lot of confusion. And, and I think people in the industry, certainly people in the industry I talk to, will, will talk about how um, they're sort of still struggling to try to correct mis, you know, misperceptions about that. And, and I just I actually wanted to, to, to end on one thought, because there's been a lot of talk today about natural gas as a bridge fuel. Um, bridge to, you know, in 10 or 15 years, development of more renewables, et cetera. And, and I, was, I, I went back and opened up my computer because I was really struck that last month in November, Chesapeake, major producer of natural gas here in the United States, um, had a uh, PowerPoint presentation. And here's the quote from it. Natural gas is no longer a bridge fuel. It should be viewed as baseload fuel for decades to come. So I sort of throw that out there just to kind of point out that I don't think that uh, bridge fuel is, uh, is a consensus. Um, and that this energy fight we find ourselves in um, is going to continue and, and therefore, hopefully, um, we'll be able to continue reporting on it and providing information so that people can make good informed choices because we're in the middle of uh, a once in a generation, once every two generation change uh, in the energy landscape and, um, and it's confusing and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll continue to provide some guidance. Russell, thank you. Cliff. Russell is an excellent reporter, <laughs> a worthy competitor, but I'm going to really have to do a fact check on that 2010, because if we weren't calling it fracking, what were we calling it? But, but anyway, but, but uh, it's funny because I thought until now I had finally come up with my epithet on my tombstone, which would be the man who misspelled fracking the first time, but I guess maybe that's not so. But anyway, you know, it's, it's great being here. I, I get invitations to, to a lot of conferences. I go to a few. I remember the first couple that I went to six years ago when I started covering um, energy, and I didn't know what was going on. People were talking about carbon sequestration and advanced biofuels and, and uh, the economics of, of uh, this and that. And the complexity uh, was, was daunting. And, and I can tell you that I've, I've, I'm an experienced reporter. I've covered a lot of things. There is nothing as complex that I have ever covered as, as much as energy. And I'm still learning every day um, because you have the confluence of, of not just the politics and the economics. The politics is like sports. That's easy. The, 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 the science, I mean, you can take almost every story down to a molecular level. And when I go out into the fields and I'm talking to, to geologists and I'm talking to, to engineers, the, the, it's fascinating, but at the end of the day, our job, and, and I don't know about my colleagues, how much science background they, they have, mine is, is, is pitifully uh, modest, but um, at the end of the day, what we have to do is, is translate 
big ideas and, 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 and sometimes very micro science for a general audience. We, we, we can't afford to get into, you know, the discussion of Louisiana Suite versus WTI versus, versus uh, Brent, although we have to understand those concepts. So, um, but I can tell you I get a lot of nasty emails every day with people correcting me. <laughs> the most, but the, the most common one is from engineers who say, you idiot, you don't know how to spell fracking. <laughs> and I can tell you that I wrote this down w days ago. And I've been getting that email for more than the last two years, I can guarantee you that. I get it all the time. The other, the other email that I get repeatedly is, you idiot. Invariably, it starts with you idiot. And I have a feeling it may be the same person writing the same emails over and over again. Fracking, and of course, always spelled with two Cs, is not a drilling technique. It is a completion technique. I understand that. But for us, for, for, for the general audience, we put completion and drilling in the same category. It's, it's, it's the well, stupid. It's just making the well so that we can get this stuff out of the ground. Then the, the other challenge, so, so I, I, I try to be, I try to politely explain that, yes, I understand that we're trying to simplify for the audience, but still we're trying to get it right. Um, the other thing is putting things into context. You know, most of our stories are 1,100 words, 1,200 words. They used to be longer. And to put in the context, which is, you know, the economics, the politics, climate, you name it, and, and, and we're supposed to get that all in, plus whatever the news is, it's not easy. But we, we, we try. The biggest problem I find is access. You say New York Times to an oil man, they break out in hives, okay? And then you put that together with a New York accent on the phone, you got problems, and, you know. So, so that, that, that's a challenge, but, you know, it, it's fun. Um, my first year, I just went back and, and took a look at, you know, some of the things that I was covering or that was going on in my first year, 2006. And it was, you know, President Bush calling for an end to America's addiction to oil. Uh, Petrobras making the first big discoveries offshore br Brazil. Um, Nigeria, you know, the men's guerrilla group, uh, you know, making chaos in the oil patch in Nigeria. Um, the United Nations enacting the first sanctions of, on Iran's nuclear program. And every, oh, and then there was the BP pipeline um, leak in the Alaska's tundra. And this, this, and this has been happening year after year after year. Of course, the BP accident got the most play, the most exposure, but it's really been uh, a, a very, very active beat. And change, enormous change. One of the first stories I did was visiting Chenier's uh, LNG platform out on the Gulf. They were gonna be importing gas, you'll all remember that. And everybody, you know, some people were saying this was gonna be, you know, very, very important. I went back two years later, right after the inauguration, empty, white elephant. Nobody was interested in importing uh, gas into the United States because of fracking, however you want to spell the word. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, so last year I visited the terminal again, and now the terminal is being prepared for export. And so, you know, I keep writing this story and it's become sort of my barometer, but it's also a lesson to me. And I went back, I read some of those stories in preparation for today, and I, you know, some of the experts that I interviewed six years ago are still experts I interviewed today, and they were all wrong. They were all wrong about natural gas, where natural gas prices were gonna go. And then so, so, so what I wanna leave here is, is that after six years of conferences, six years of talking to experts, I can tell you that in six years from now, everything will be different from today, and that's, and that's that's an amazing thing about, about energy. And so it, it, leaves, it leaves me with a certain modesty about writing about climate change and, and, and energy 
because the technology is always changing, the politics are always changing, and uh, that makes it fun, and uh, hopefully I'll be back in six years, and we'll talk about the last six years. Cliff, that was great, thank you. <laughs> Carl? Good afternoon, so I am the uh, only non-native English speaker here, so I apologize in advance for my mistakes. And Not I, counting the New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I've got to read my notes and they're on, yeah, I can, I can? Okay. Very good, yeah, so I'm sorry, I've got to read, otherwise it's gonna be messy. Um, first of all, uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, stress that I am very pleased um, to be part of this panel because I have always been uh, interested as a reporter but also as a citizen in um, energy issues and uh, because I have understood at a very early stage in my career how important um, these uh, energy issues are and let me um, tell you why. I was a very junior, very young, inexperienced reporter uh, when I started at La Tribune, a French uh, business paper uh, that was the late 90s. And I used to uh, cover uh, heavy industries such as the steel industry. Uh, then in the summer of 1999, one of my uh, colleagues in charge of, the, um, of energy uh, went on vacation and I had to um, um, fill in for her. And it was a very interesting time, actually, to uh, do so because um, French oil company Total at that time launched a uh, take off a bit of an elf. I don't know if you remember that story. Um, it was very interesting because Total uh, was uh, three times, uh, from, uh, elf, sorry, was three times as big as um, Total. So it was a very unusual uh, take off a bit. Uh, Elf, uh, in return, launched a reverse take off a bid, starting one of the most spectacular battles uh, in the history of French capitalism. Uh, it was very intense, it was very political, of course. Uh, the whole country was watching, not only the whole country, but the whole of Europe and everybody interested in, uh, in uh, energy. And the CEOs of uh, both companies were under enormous pressure, as you can imagine. One day, um, my team's assistant's phone rang and she picked up the phone and she turned to me saying, Carl, it's Philippe Jaffray on the phone for you. So Philippe Jaffray was um, LF's CEO. And he spent nearly an hour on the phone with uh, a 26 year old journalist explaining to me why his bid made uh, much more sense than Total's. Um, incidentally, he finally lost the battle, but uh, it, it helped me understand how uh, critical all these uh, issues are, and um, I thought, yeah, it's a very interesting beat to uh, cover because it has to do with national politics, international relations, uh, financial markets, societal issues, environmental issues. I thought, yeah, it's definitely interesting. Years later, I was uh, appointed a EU correspondent for my uh, current employer. And even though the EU has very few prerogatives when it comes to energy, I soon realized how uh, critical the issue also at EU level was. For instance, when uh, Russia shut off gas supplies to uh, Europe through um, Ukraine, that was a very, very big story. Or when the EU negotiated its legislative package on its plan to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, it's only in Brussels that I realized that the member states have very, very uh, specific and diverse stances on um, energy. And I'd say that the politicians' views on uh, the right energy mix, for instance, uh, very often are more determined by their nationality than by their um, ideological background. I found it very, very striking. And as a Frenchman, for instance, I was trained to think that nuclear power is good for the environment. Uh, uh, if you, seriously, if you, if you studied in France in the 70s, the 80s, or the 90s, you've been told dozens of times that uh, nuclear energy is uh, clean, cheap, that it grounds energy independence to the country, and that it illustrates also uh, French technological excellence. Uh, and these ideas shocked my uh, Brussels-based German friends, uh, of course. <laughs> I didn't understand why at the time. I understood much better years later when I was appointed a Berlin correspondent. And then I found it really captivating how Chancellor Merkel uh, in, uh, in uh, Germany reacted to the Fukushima disaster in, uh, in, in Japan. I don't know if you remember, but she announced a moratorium on nuclear power within hours, although uh, her coalition had agreed on an extension of the lives of the existing German nuclear plants only months earlier. 
So that was a, a very, very um, quick uh, reaction. Um, a member of German parliament uh, told me weeks later that she had no choice and he said, well, you know, hadn't she shut down the oldest nuclear plants, millions of Germans would have demonstrated uh, on the street and uh, potentially they would have forced her to resign. She had no choice. And since the 70s, nuclear power has been very controversial in Germany, much more than in uh, France, notably on account of the Green Party that is much stronger in, in Germany than uh, in France. Meanwhile, in my home country, the vast majority of the media criticized the Germans for being selfish, for acting uh, irresponsibly, for uh, without any consultation at EU level. And three months later, when Germany announced that it would shut down uh, for good all its reactors by 2022, the French were really uh, bitter. I remember like a lot of op-eds in the French press uh, stressed that Germany had taken a very hypocritical decision because it would need to import nuclear energy uh, from France or the Czech Republic. They also highlighted the fact that this measure was likely to destabilize the European power grid in winter because Germany wouldn't be able to cover its uh, needs, its, uh, its energy supply. The tone was pretty aggressive um, for a lot of reasons. I think partially because all this happened at a moment when the EU was weakened by the financial crisis and France was even more weakened than Germany. You know, the export-based um, German model proved to be much more resilient than the French consumption-based um, economy. Chancellor Merkel um, had taken the lead and she seemed to be able to uh, dictate her conditions to the whole of Europe. So that was a pretty tough moment. And the fact that the continent's largest economy decides to uh, give up nuclear energy, that was a very bad signal for France. It was a very severe blow to French nuclear ambitions. At the time, the French were trying to sell nuclear plants um, abroad, and um, they were trying to sell the, a new generation of reactors. And the first of them, built in Finland, had numerous technical, technical problems. So it, I think it explains part of the, of, of the reaction. But, once again, I realize that energy is definitely a very sensitive issue and a matter of uh, national pride. Uh, the German press, of course, was much more uh, moderate, and Chancellor Merkel's move was much less controversial in Germany than in France, even though um, uh, the more uh, conservative newspapers, of course, criticized her about face, saying that it was bad for uh, the competitiveness of German industry. But what I found very interesting is what happened the winter that followed. It was a very cold winter in Europe, uh, in Germany and in France. And actually, it's France that had problems to cover its own needs because of a lot of households um, uh, used electric heatings in the 80s in order to justify the, um, the development and the, all the, the, the nuclear program of the country. The authorities have promoted electric heating. And as a consequence, in the winter of 2011, France had to import electricity from Germany. So the, the German media, of course, highlighted France's problems. Uh, of, course. of course. The French media, surprisingly, did not seem to bother to report so much about it, and I found it very, very ironic. In my mind, it just goes to show that the media have a strong national uh, bias. It's very deeply rooted. It comes, I think, from the education system, from the national long-time established, uh, established preferences from culture, and after 65 years of European integration, public spaces, I think, remain uh, very, very um, uh, different, very, very uh, specific across the EU. I could also mention the British media and their uh, coverage of the EU Commission's investigation over a pool in England uh, that contains a great deal of uh, nuclear waste. Uh, it was also very funny to see how the British media reported on, on the EU Commission's investigation. Uh, Anyway, so now that I uh, live here in the US and that I also cover energy issues, I just experience the same. Um, the French are very, very interested in the boom of uh, uh, shale gas and unconventional oil. Uh, just before the presidential election here in, in the US, I wrote an entire page about the new American energy mix. Uh, as you know, the Europeans in, in general, except for the Poles and the British, are um, much more skeptical about fracking technologies. They care, more, they care more about the environmental consequences, but on the other hand, they also can see that uh, these new sources of energy give American companies a tremendous competitive advantage. And precisely at a time when Europe is obsessed with its decline and uh, particularly its industrial decline. 
So again, the media coverage in Europe is very different from what it is on this side of the uh, Atlantic. There is a clear line between those who put the emphasis on the environmental consequences and those who think Europe is about to lose ground and should tap its own shale gas reserves. Uh, what strikes me here in the US is the lack of controversy. I've seen only very few articles about the uh, ecological consequences, or I'd say that it's not covered the same way it is in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, I have read several reviews of the movie that is going to uh, come out soon with uh, uh, Matt Damon. But all in all, yeah, I, I don't think the issue is discussed the same way uh, as it is in, um, in Europe. I don't know if you remember the second presidential debate between President Obama and, uh, and Mitt Romney. Um, but when ed energy was um, mentioned, the question was to which extent President Obama had somehow hindered um, the increase of oil output, uh, including unconventional oil, during his first mandate. But no one really questioned the environmental impact of an increased usage of uh, fossil energies. Uh, in Europe, it's very, very different, of course. Even if they are not really convinced, the political parties that seriously aspire to win an election have to present a plan to um, promote green energy. Um, I'm not saying that they all believe in the uh, you know, potential of growth, potential of jobs growth that are um, uh, related with, uh, with uh, uh, green technologies, but I don't think that any serious politician could mock green technologies the way Mitt Romney did with Solyndra, for instance. I don't know if you, uh, if, you, if, if you remember. Now, if you ask me why there is such a difference between continental Europe and, and, and the US, uh, I have some personal explanations. I don't know if, if they are right, but um, I can sense here a vast cultural gap um, uh, in the perception of nature. Um, I think it has to do with, with uh, space. As you know, Europe is just more crowded than America. It's a question of population density, especially in countries such as the Netherlands, uh, um, Belgium, Germany. Uh, there are just more people. And I think Europeans in general have a different relationship to nature that might come from 19th century romanticism, which itself has its roots in medieval tales and literature. And let me tell you another uh, anecdote that I found very, very re revealing. I don't know if you remember when the um, Icelandic volcano disrupted transatlantic air traffic. Uh, I was then in Berlin. And we had dinner with uh, two friends, an American friend who, was, uh, um, who lives also in, in, in Berlin and a Swiss friend who was visiting. And the Swiss, who was grounded in Berlin, said, well, you know, in a way, I found it good that from time to time we are reminded that Mother Nature is just uh, they're more powerful than we humans. And the American friends say, wait, no, like, I don't understand why they don't find a solution to stop the eruption. There, there, there must be a way to bomb the volcano or something. <laughs> And I was like, OK. Uh, <laughs> again, I found it very, very revealing. So I think it, it has an impact on, on, on the media coverage, you know, because journalists are just humans, and they also have a background. They also have a history. And that might explain part of the difference in the coverage. Thank you for your attention. Carl, thank you. Uh, and then finally, David. Here we have slides now, too. Very exciting. That's okay. Just the down arrow. All right. I'm an environmental journalist, last but not least. And uh, I want to provide an environmental perspective on these issues. It's a little bit different from uh, a lot of what we've been hearing today, mostly in terms of emphasis. But I am going to go out on a limb and try to describe to you what I think is going to reside in the public mind as the story of the century. Because it takes into account the experience of individuals uh, in the face of uh, environmental changes that are upon us on a scale that we've never seen before. So I'll also make some comments about some developments in the media um, and uh, provide a context of how that, uh, the industry is changing and how that's going to influence uh, the way these things are covered. Uh, those changes have a lot to do with why I'm able to be standing here as a small nonprofit, and it's very important to understand that as well. Um, in other words, uh, what is the story of the century and how do we all fit into it? 
That's what I'm going to talk about in the next 10 minutes. Uh, let's begin here with this interesting statistic that, again, brings the experience of fossil fuel prosperity right down to the individual level. Um, one barrel of oil contains enough calories, the same amount of calories, as 10 men working eight hours a day, six days a week for an entire year. Now, let's remember that um, oil was quote unquote discovered in 1859, right about the time when the Civil War was breaking out and another enormous economic system that relied on slavery was disappearing. And now we've come to the point where me as an average American uh, enjoys the labor of 230 full-time staff because of the oil I consume. That is the story of fossil fuel prosperity on an individual level that is so profound and that explains why fossil fuels have become so valuable and important and why everybody in the world wants them and wants to burn them. And we've seen all kinds of things about uh, how uh, fossil fuel is a measure of prosperity. Um, that, however, is not the story of this century. That's maybe half the story. That was the story of the last century. This century, uh, we have to look at the other side of the coin of fossil fuels. And um, it's, a, it's a difficult story. And I don't think I've I really heard the challenge expressed today as big as I think it is. And I think as big as the public is coming to understand how big this challenge is. Uh, the quote over there for, from Bill McKibben, he is saying as an activist that 80% of current fossil fuel reserves need to stay in the ground. The chief economist of the International Energy Agency, in a way, is saying the same thing. He's an economist. He works for an agency that uh, serves the oil industry. Uh, so there, there is a unanimity across uh, the spectrum, leaving politics aside, of this existential challenge that we face. I'm not making this up. The World Bank is on board with the same thing. Uh, and there are links, as many as you would care to find, uh, that will describe this challenge. The IPCC is coming out with a report next year. Uh, these, are, these are all part of the human story that we need to address. So when I look at um, what the story of the century is, I need to add this phrase, environmental security. I live in New York. We experienced Hurricane Sandy. There are droughts and wildfires all over the country. Uh, there was Katrina. You, you can add to the list of catastrophes of a magnitude that uh, is enormous. And we are only at one degree of warming. And the projection is, according to the World Bank or anyone else you care to talk to, in this century, four degrees centigrade. That's seven degrees Fahrenheit. It, it, it's staggering. Um, and I think that these pictures, uh, the reason I put them here is this is what the public sees and thinks about. This is what they experience more and more and are connecting to the dots, connecting the dots to our uh, energy choices and energy decisions. Um, I put the dust bowl up there. This uh, Ken Burns um, series that just came out uh, recently and was televised um, because it captured the imagination of America in a different way. It was talking about an environmental catastrophe that happened in the 30s that was on a scale that we don't want to recognize. 
So again, something in the popular culture is reinforcing this understanding of our dependence upon the environment and how vulnerable we are. So I would say that the story of the century from a media point of view, not just an environmental point of view, environmental journalist point of view, is this conflict, this tension, this challenge. That is where the story resides. And I think increasingly, as you guys report from the business side, you're going to have to be including the climate side uh, in the same story, without fail. I mean, it, it, the story won't work otherwise. And the public won't feel the stories are credible. Um, these are the two sort of responses. Uh, I mean, to, to illustrate the tension on the, on the right, there is the story, oh, the polar ice caps are melting. Uh, great, let's go get the oil. <laughs> right? That's, uh, that's a response. Um, on the other hand, there is this film. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It just was released. Um, I beg you to see it. A National Geographic photographer um, set up cameras in 40 locations in Iceland and Greenland and Alaska and some other places um, at great peril to his own life. Um, the cameras took pictures of glaciers every hour for years. And they put together a film. And uh, I am steeped in climate science and issues. I was stunned. I had no idea how bad it was, how bad it is. It's something we really have to take into consideration as we make our projections about uh, fossil fuel consumption and how fast and how quickly and how much it will cost. Also, keep in mind the catastrophes, the price tag on Sandy is 60 billion. And with increasing frequency, how long is the public going to bear the costs that are being externalized by industry? It's a fair question. Um, how is this tension going to be resolved? OK, here's one answer that is sweeping the country right now. Um, Bill McKibben went on a tour around college campuses a week after the election. And already, 200 campuses are signed on to try and convince their universities to divest from fossil fuels. Whether that's a good strategy or not, whether it will succeed or not, is actually not the issue. The issue is, you have a situation where, look, the current cohort of college students and the next one coming in, and the one before that helped elect Obama, are being sensitized to something that is not on the balance sheet. It's called the moral issue involved in this thing. And that is going to be a big story and is going to change the way the politics works and the way discourse works and the way media is going to be talking and everything else. Um, a pragmatic approach. We did this book. This is a plug for our book. Mm -hmm. um, we just uh, published it in November. And uh, we tell the story of Germany's energy transformation, how they got to 25% renewables already and are on track to get to 80%, if not 100 by 2050 in the power sector. Uh, the competitive advantage of that is staggering to think about, purely in economic terms. Um, this is a story that Americans don't understand, which is one reason we wanted to do it, because the environmentalists were saying, we can go to renewables. And we said, well, has anybody done it? How do you do it? So we went and tried to find a real life example, and that's what we're reporting on. Um, It's, it's, an, it's an incredible story, and we, it's short. We, it, we're just scratching the surface. But these are the kinds of things that need to be discussed. Uh, finally, is, journalists, is journalism uh, capable of dealing with this story? 
Okay, it's, it's been a massacre in the industry. And it, it's, it's incredible um, what has happened. There are many journalists who are out of work and many newspapers have closed and it is a danger because it will affect the way in which we're able to make decisions. If we are not well informed as a citizenry. So there are a lot of nonprofits that have stepped up in different ways. We are one of them at Inside Climate News. Um, the Economist is even writing about this phenomenon. And the other interesting thing that's happening is that it's no longer the publication that is the atomic unit, if you will, of journalism. It is the single story living in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. So if we do a good story, everybody reads it, it gets picked up, and so on. So there's, in the carnage of the industry, there's still this very interesting opportunity. Uh, that's our homepage. I just put it up there to show you that we look at climate science and gas and pipelines and nuclear, it's all one story. And we're looking at the tension between them. And, and we think that's what the story is and what it's going to be as we go on. A uh, little praise from Columbia Journalism Review. I'm a little insecure. I want to prove that we're good. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the Associated Press, they won awards for their coverage of the nuclear issue. Um, they're a nonprofit. Uh, co uh, collective, or uh, and we followed in their heels covering one nuclear plant, the story of one nuclear plant in, in uh, San Diego, and the troubles there. As uh, you know, we can do what we can. We're seven people. We're not, we're not a large organization. Similarly with fracking, you had the coverage from ProPublica that broke a lot of, of this story open in the public imagination. And we've done our share of stories um, again, trying to look at the tension between the energy opportunity and environmental security. And if you think it's only the uh, nonprofit uh, world, AP, ProPublica, us, that is doing this, um, the, an 800 pound gorilla just entered the fray. I don't know if you saw this, but this uh, cover from uh, Bloomberg Business Week was released just a few hours before Bloomberg endorsed Obama uh, for, the, for the presidency. And um, they have metrics on their financial uh, terminals that track all kinds of carbon risk and all kinds of things like that. So they are all over this, and they're seeing this story going here. The last thing I'll say is that they are thinking about making a bid for the Financial Times, which is also a very significant uh, issue in the industry. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll end. And uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Good, David. Thank you. So really, really terrific fodder from our four panelists. Uh, a lot to talk about. And some of it I would put into the camp of process that is to say, media coverage of these issues, and some of it in the realm of substance, the issues being covered. I thought I might take the bait from David and start with the process questions, because there's no question that what David and others have alluded to is that the landscape for media coverage of these issues has been impacted by the decline of many of the outlets, either decline, they still exist, but they're limping along, or just the disappearance outright of many of the outlets that cover this stuff. Represented on the stage are two of the biggest, if not the two biggest, news organizations that we all pay attention to in this country, in uh, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And I want to ask Cliff and Russell to talk first about the extent to which cutbacks at your organizations and other organizations have refocused the priorities of the industry. What is being lost in terms of the coverage of these issues as the number of reporters and the number of venues go down? Well, I think there's no doubt that uh, we have seen a decline in the depth of news 
um, over the years, at least from uh, print, paid for sub subscription-based print publications. Um, and and I, I notice it just in terms of that I don't quite get what I feel is the sort of in-depth reporting um, that that I would like to see um, from my you know from around you know just as a reader. Um, however, I have also noticed that sometimes when the the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times leave a gap, it's filled. It's filled. I mean, nature abhors a, vo a vacuum, and, and we are seeing some of those vacuums get filled. Um, Inside Climate News is a perfect example. Um, but, you know, I, and David mentioned, I think, one of the more fascinating stories um, that's emerged, which is uh, Bill McKibben and his sort of college campus tour selling out, or I don't know if he's selling, but filling 2,000 person auditoriums talking about climate change math. I, I would never have predicted 12 months ago that you could do a lecture on climate change math and have 2,000 college students come on out to see it. Um, that's a story that eluded me, um, but McKibben, sort of writing first person, put it right in the Rolling Stone. And he, and, and when I read that story, I actually went back and traced backwards sort of where he was getting some of his math from. And it started off in London with some financial advisors writing about, well, are the major oil companies, um, are we paying too much for them? Is their market cap too large? Which is a classic Wall Street Journal type story. And the point they were making was is that if all of the found reserves of oil and coal and gas are burned, then we're going to go well beyond the four degrees centigrade. Uh, there's no way the governments are going to let that happen. So a lot of Exxon and Chevron and other people's reserves will not ever be burnt and yet their market cap is based on that. So it's just sort of an example for me that, you know, sometimes when uh, the larger newspapers miss a story, we're seeing a lot of entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurialism picking up and grabbing that story, picking up that small two-year-ago report out of London, burnishing it, polishing it, and, and, and getting it out in front of everybody, and then filling up 2,000 seat uh, auditoriums. But of course, Russell, that should have been in the wall, in theory, that should have been a Wall Street Journal story at the time. It shouldn't have had to wait two years for that gap to be created and then filled. Yes, in theory, it should have been. Um, you know, we have not, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't think it'd be very fair for me to blame cutbacks. The Wall Street Journal's been very lucky. Um, we have not seen a huge number of cutbacks. I think the energy team is basically the same size as it was yep. eight years ago. Um, so, I, I would like to be able to blame cutbacks on that, but, but no, you can't. but I can't. Uh, Cliff, one of the things you hear, I, I want you to address what Russell is saying, but yeah. I also want to ask you about the degree to which with the departure of some veteran journalists at some of the organizations that have had cutbacks, institutional memory is now often housed inside a 27-year-old. And I wonder to what degree that change has had an impact on you, coverage of, you, of these issues. You know, I, I don't think it has at the times. I, you know, if we, there's no question that the media is in a sad state these days. Probably less the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times than, say, the LA Times, the Washington Post, and then on the local level, it's, it's, a, it's a total disaster. And, and if this conference were not about energy, I would talk, I could go into you know, holes in coverage and all yep. of that. I think on energy, we're, more, we're, we're, we're focused on it. Um, you know, we, we lost Andrew Revkin. Who, who was full-time climate coverage, and I don't think we've missed a beat because we have Justin Gillis, who's one of the premier reporters on the staff who does nothing but write about climate change, long takeouts, travels all over the world to write about it. So I, I, I'm happy about that. And um, so I, I think the cutbacks have hurt us in other areas more than, than climate and energy. Uh, but there's no question that, you know, we have to pick our spots. Um, stories are shorter than they used to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still will spend a lot of time on stories, uh, which is a luxury, but the, the stories, you know, tend to be a little bit shorter unless we're really, we really focused on something that's very big. You feel, Cliff, that the, that the amount of coverage across time is, is adequate, which is to say anybody can cover a crisis. Yeah. But the real trick to coverage or adequate coverage would be covering things kind of all the time, not just when these things flare well, up. It is. 
you know, that's it's never adequate, right? Yeah. I mean, never you know, enough. we all there's never enough. We want, right. you know, uh, it would be great if we had more people and we had more space and all of that. But I do feel that, you know, on energy, climate, and the environment, you know, it is, it, it, we're emphasizing that because it is a priority of senior management. And, and that priority has been set. The message comes down. They want, they want more. They want us working harder, writing more. Right. The, pay, the stories get on the front page. That's not true for other subjects that I'm not going to get into here because this is an energy conference. Right. You know, we used to have a we used to have a person based full time in, in in Eastern Europe. We had a person who's full time in the Caribbean. So there are places that you know don't get as much coverage as they used to. But energy is not not, not necessarily. I don't feel. One, I don't think of. so. Uh, David, you are management in in the construction that Clifford just offered. So of course you're you are ordering your team of seven in total, as you said to to make this stuff first and foremost, but in some ways you're the beneficiary of the misery down on this end of the table. To the, the degree that there is any misery, you're the one who's filling in what they're either choosing not to do or can no longer do by virtue of numbers and circumstances. That's right, and uh, the thing that we decided was we don't need to chase breaking news. Yep. That frees us up to go deep on stories. Well, these papers and others are still good at that, wherever, yes. whatever else they may be challenged yes. on, right? Yes, why compete with them on that? Right. But we can find the gaps because we know the, the territory. Right. And, uh, you know, we've staked out a few areas where we're really, we really own the story. Yeah. And it's an opportunity for us. And there are other organizations that are doing similar things. Right. Um, it also helps uh, the public understand better when an organization like ours can do a narrative story yeah. so that ordinary readers can get it and also do deep investigations. And we do both. And that's kind of where we're picking our spot. Are you perceived in any way that the Times and the Journal constantly wrestle with this perception of whether there's bias? And I think you know, most sensible people would say there's not bias in the news coverage. There may be a point of view on the editorial pages, but it's not entirely accurate to slam the papers as either liberal or conservative in the news pages. But an organization like yours coming out of the ground essentially fully formed, maybe people have cause to wonder, as you're partnering with some of these other organizations and feeding them content, are you feeding them something that's similarly unbiased or nonpartisan, or are you having to combat the perception that you have a point of view? Uh, not at all. I mean, we, we, uh, we don't have any problem uh, having our stories picked up by the mainstream. Right. And they perceive no bias. Right. Um, we get asked this question a lot, and you know, I usually answer it by saying, if you're a business reporter, there is a bit of a built-in bias where you would say a stronger economy is better, more right. jobs is better. If you're an education reporter, higher scores are better, yep. better graduation rates. So in a similar way, we, I suppose we have a bias. A cleaner environment is better. Mm -hmm. Fewer hurricanes are better. Right. But we report and we talk to all sides, and we do our best to balance the story, and we really are going after the tension between right. the two sides of the story. Now, Carl, in, in, in so many ways, uh, Europe is not America, America is not Europe, and so the perception of how the European media regards this question of the decline in our industry and the decline in its own industry, I'm assuming you view those as different uh, uh, in that respect as you do other things. So what, ha what has the, the hit to the media industry worldwide meant in your world in terms of the ability to cover this stuff aggressively? Mm -hmm. So uh, um, as for the French market, uh, well, we are going through uh, dire times too. Um, our main competitor, La Tribune, for which I used to work when I was a younger um, uh, reporter, has decided to go only online, for instance. Uh, but for us, like it uh, doesn't mean much more readers or much more uh, advertisements. So I find it worrying because it just means that the market is shrinking. Yep. Um, there are fewer and fewer readers um, anyway. But just like Clifford, um, I must say that at my paper at least, um, energy has been um, um, recognized and set as a priority. So I can't really uh, complain about that. Again, right. it has to do with the fact that well, the senior management is interested in the issue, and society, I think, is interested, uh, all in all. And as I um, uh, stressed in my presentation, the French have this obsession with Germany. Uh, I wonder why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they, they really, I find that's how I feel, like they are um, afraid of losing ground. Um, and because Germany has taken such radical decisions, they, they, 
they really want to know what other countries do. So that's in Europe, but that's also in America with the old shale gas and the um, yep. unconventional um, um, oil. Um, so there is definitely a lot of space for us if you want, if we want to write about um, energy, and the, the the department, the section in charge of industry and and energy is is still pretty well staffed. So we can't really um, right. complain. Uh, as for the German market that I know pretty well, it's the same thing. The Financial Times Deutschland, so it was the second largest uh, business paper, has just uh, shut down. It was the last. Um, uh, the last edition was on December 7. Bertelsmann, the, the, the owner, has decided to, um, to stop it. It was launched in 2000, but it never made a profit. Right. So I think it's pretty much the same situation as in France. Now you just have the Handelsblatt, the, the, the leader. Um, but I, yeah, it's truly to say what the consequences what, what the is. What the impact yeah. will be. Uh, Cliff, what, I'm he what I've heard in a series of these presentations here to begin this panel was a discussion of, is the public aware enough of the challenge that the energy issues that we're confronting now uh, present. Uh, it, has there been willful ignorance on the part of the public in terms of the consideration of many of these issues, not just climate change, but others? I wonder to what degree you feel obligated at the times to educate people on the importance of th these issues, not just to report on the news, but to yeah. almost reach out from the pages of the paper and grab them by the lapels mm -hmm. and say, pay attention. You don't understand how important this is. Pay attention. Almost, a it walks up to the line of advocacy. Uh, well. You know, just by putting something on the front page as opposed to putting something on page 32, that's an editorial decision, which is, this is important. It's an affirmative decision. You need, you right. need to, you know, there are some things that are obvious. Right. Uh, energy is kind of like gun control in a way. Um, it's it's, it's kind of people, <laughs> I think they care, they, they care about it when it hits them in a major way like Sandy. Um, and, uh, but from a day-to-day -day level, and, and I don't mean this to sound like a criticism of, of, of people, maybe this is just um, human nature, and human nature obviously is flawed, but what is it that people think about, the average person, they, ca they care about the price of, of gasoline, and so it becomes a big issue when, you know, the Republicans will wag their finger at, you know, at something that Secretary Chu said, uh, years ago that we should have higher gasoline prices, higher oil prices. Well, there's, there's, a, there's, some, there's an economic reason for that. I think people are thinking about that. I'm talking about the average person. Energy security, certainly. Yep. Um, uh, so because, because we're so linked with the Middle East, and, and, and of course the Middle East is linked with the rest of the world economy. On climate, it, it's one of these things that... Um, you know, maybe, maybe things are changing now with Sandy. Maybe Sandy is going to be like, you know, the Connecticut shooting. People will, will wake up and say, you know what, this is really something that we need to urgently pay attention to. I don't know if that's true. Well, the jury, I think in both I mean, those I, cases, heard, the jury is still out. We, the we just jury don't know. is still out. We, 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 we went through this and, you know, with the hurricanes, uh, you know, in, in, in Katrina and Rita, yeah. one after the other, and then Ike. Right. And, 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 and so at what point, when is the tipping point? Um, I think the jury is out. Uh, uh, Russell, I'm, I'm interested to hear Cliff talk about the importance of these issues from the perspective of, of times management. We want to put them on the front page, not on the inside. Right. It sounds like, I'm putting words in Cliff's mouth here, but I think this is a pretty good <laughs> guess, that uh -oh. the institutional position of the times is we believe in climate change and we believe in the importance of this issue. Uh, the facile way to think about the Wall Street Journal to David's point about economic development and job creators trumping m most, if not all, other things, is that the journal's institutional position might be against climate change. It doesn't exist. This is a, it's a chupacabra, environmentally, basically. You know, it's this thing that we chase after constantly, but doesn't exist, and we should just pretend, we should, we, we should no longer pretend that it actually exists. I think my answer actually is probably different today than it was six or 12 months ago. And I think six or 12 months ago, the Wall Street Journal, the, the, the edict that came down was that we, if you're going to write a story and write about climate change and write about those issues, you needed to acknowledge that there were people out there, um, reasonable scientists, who had a different point of view. You just couldn't ignore that. Um, my sense is in the last six months that internally at the Wall, at the Wall Street Journal, 
there's been an acknowledgement that most of those voices have now changed. And most of the people, well, I'm not talking about deniers, but most of the, the institutional scientists who have looked at this and said, well, we're not quite sure, even those people are now going over. And so I think they're, they we're in the middle of a little bit of change on that issue. Now, now you have, we were visiting about this beforehand, uh, or David and I were, I think, that the, the new chairman of the U.S. House of Representatives Science Committee is Lamar Smith from Texas, who is known to disbelieve in climate change. So is it then the position of the Wall Street Journal, if there's been a perceptible shift in the way that you view this, mm -hmm. that every time that a Lamar Smith as chairman of the House Science Committee uh, directs the conversation away from the existence of climate change, that the journal is going to edi editorialize against Lamar Smith? Well, I don't know what, I, I'm not gonna talk about their editorial position because that's, you know, the Chinese wall separates reporters from, from the editorial writers. Um, so I'm not sure I really can answer that, but. I don't think the same emphasis exists that you need. I think you can now write a story about energy and climate change, and you don't have to go out with, of With a straight face. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, David, let me move the conversation away from climate into fracking, because we visited a bit of, up here. You all talked to some degree about fracking and coverage of fracking. Uh, Russell mentioned Gasland. Um, but, of course, there are a number of different projects that have no shortage of point of view about the impact of fracking on, on both sides, quite frankly, but yeah. more on the side of we have to be careful about the potential pitfalls and evils and the environmental consequences and the impact on water and, and what have you. Um, does that whole line of media, that whole sort of documentary, filmmaking, advocacy sort of journalism, noticeably shift the conversation in the mainstream, or do you think that most people who consume content on this subject understand the difference between reporting and advocacy? Or is it, or has it all become blurred as the various... Yeah, that's... A, that's is, is, the, is the guy who made Josh, whatever his name, is yeah. the guy who made Gasland effectively no different than a journalist reporting on these issues in the eyes of most people? It's all essentially same, same. No, I, I think people can draw a distinction. And I think that... Uh, the part of the problem is the conversation is so polarized. Yeah. So there are people on one side and there are people on the other. They will only see what they want to see, no right. matter what is presented to them. So uh, I think that you know there is an intelligent middle that will put aside their biases, and uh, I think they will be able to see uh, you know uh, what Gasland is, and. Uh, if they can't, they will read more to f see the criticisms. I think that there is an intelligent middle that tries to triangulate stories to get perspective. So, uh, you know, the main thing is that there is a valid discussion that needs to happen around all these issues. So it does serve that larger purpose. But, but, but I would say that I, I think there is a need for a valid discussion. I, I What concerns me on the whole fracking issue is, is that the water issue has so dominated um, the conversation and what's lost, and, and there's, a lot to, there's, a, there's a lot to say about fracking um, environmentally beyond the water, the, the air pollution, the fracturing of, of, of natural habitat, all of the traffic, there's also the issue of does it or does it not release methane. On the other side, there is if you don't frack, if you don't produce more natural gas, what are you left with? Well, under the current economic system and, and uh, government policies, you're left with more coal, which also has problems for, for water and air and, and, and everything else. So unfortunately, I'm afraid that 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 the the you know the uh, uh, one or two movies about fracking and the water issue um, has challenged the rest of us to give it more to give it a, a broader perspective, which is not to say that we don't need to have a, a serious conversation about. It. Yeah, you know, the, I think the water issue is is uh, arose out of the sort of polarized nature of the discussion because both sides are trying to use science uh, as a hammer. We saw you know, the 
the oil and gas industry doing that with the climate issue? Well, it was published in the New York Times in 1998. The game plan was confuse the science. Uh, so it's part of the playbook of advocates on both sides. And, you know, the public discourse suffers, but it does eventually get uh, corrected. I hope so. Yeah. Carl, is your perception, you're the one non Native American on this, uh, you know, native U resident of the U.S. on this panel. So you're looking at it actually from a different perspective than the other than the others. D d is your perception being based in New York and, and reading and paying attention to this coverage that there is a problem with bias creeping its way in, whether it's through traditional media or non-traditional media, but that the discussion is in some way being compromised or complicated by advocacy? Mm. Well, first of all, I've been in the U.S. for only six months, so like, I... I yeah, that doesn't I stop anybody you know, else from I don't having want an opinion, to be, so you go ahead. Just no, feel, is it, feel free. You've got the fresh eyes. <laughs> I don't want yeah. to be too assertive. But, well, as I said in my presentation, I think that first, like, it's very difficult to be a, an entirely objective journalist yep. because, again, you have a background, you have an education, you had very different sense... Yeah, you had a family, you, you know, so it makes you the person you are. And, um, yeah, your background, your career, like, it has an influence on the way you see things. But, well, I think we are all, we all try to write the most objective stories that we can. Uh, then, yeah, I think there is a difference between American and European coverage because in Europe, especially in Northern Europe, uh, people care more about the environmental issues. Yep. And there is also, um, Europeans I think are more like risk adverse. So like if you have a new technology, Europeans are going to say, yeah, wait, like let's have, more, let's make more studies. Let, you know, in, uh, in Brussels at the EU commission, they would call it like an, um, an impact study. It would take years and it would have to be uh, approved by several committees and just, People want to be sure that it's not going to lead to an ecological disaster. I feel like uh, Americans are more ready to take a chance. Uh, there is a new technology. It brings, you know, it, it allows prices to fall. Uh, now I think it's two to three times lower the gas um, in the U.S. than in Europe. Right. So let's do it. And if there is a problem later, well, then we'll fix it later. That's how I see it. The reason I think the Americans can um, afford to think that way is because the country is so big. So uh, you know, I, I, I've seen a documentary, but years ago I forgot its title. It was about Alberta and uh, all the um, the sand oils in, mm -hmm. in in Alberta. It's very impressive because you see like the entire regions covered with oil sand with the right. sand oils, and you're like, yeah, but Canada is so big, so. Why not? You just I, Canadians I, say it. Yeah, but uh, you, can't, you just can't do that in Belgium. I, I guess, Carl, my, my <laughs> right, right. I guess my question is, is your perception that, that the media here may be, in a broad sense, cheerleading for industry or cheerleading for the environmental side? Again, I think it's, it's really early for me to say, no, I, um, I've, I've read like lots of very, very interesting articles, and yeah, some of them very balanced, I think. So, Good. Yeah. Russell, please. I'm, I'm not sure it's so much that, um, that the industry is cheerleading for industry or for the environmental side. What, what I hear from, from the three um, American reporters is that we're sort of cheering for some discussion about this. Right. I mean, I was really struck um, by the, the clip that was put up with the executive from Areva saying, you know, what was great is that France committed to nuclear and stuck with it and didn't change. And I was sort of thinking about the United States energy policy, which hasn't existed in my lifetime. Um, and so essentially, the United States energy policy is just, let's do it. Um, and so I think, you know, what I'm hearing from the reporters on, on this panel is, okay, well, th there are a lot of consequences involved with let's just do it. Uh, there's some great things that have happened, and there's some potentially enormous, um, you know, to use the, 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 the metaphor of the day, some enormous cliffs we're coming up to. And, you know, my sense is what we're cheerleading for is getting some information out there so we can hopefully, as a, as a public, make, make the right decision. Have a conversation about it and see where that goes. We have about 15 minutes left. I want to be sure we open it up for questions, and I think the opportunity now presents to bring you all in. Sir. Can, 
can't, I can't personally think of very many examples of this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, maybe in the trade, maybe in the trade press, but no, I don't know of any. And, and it, it, they could do a good job, but it's like a policeman covering, you know, the cop beat or somebody in the military then covering. We we have that. We've had that, and that's worked out very well. So it is possible, but I don't know of anyone. No, I would love. To, I would. I would love to see a, a petroleum engineer start a blog to really bring their inside information as to what's going on. I mean, I would really think that'd be they, fascinating. They have to know how to write and take a smaller salary. That's, that would help. <laughs> right, that, that, that last part is, is pretty much a deal killer. I agree. <laughs> right. Rich enough not to need a paycheck, sir. So we accept that there's a problem, but the question is, what do we do to solve the problem? David, that you know, a lot of people would perceive the fact that the media may be moving in the direction of any acceptance that there is a problem as a victory, right? It, that would represent significant. Yes, change. Uh, you know, just one thing. Uh, there was an op-ed in the Houston Chronicle, uh, written by a Republican, who said that the Republican platform of denial is a river that's running dry. And I thought that was remarkable to see that. Uh, you know, I read that a couple of days ago when I, when I came down here. Um, so, but I, I also think that America has a can-do attitude. So I don't think, I don't sense a skepticism. I think, you know, there are a lot of examples. The Germany story, we, it's an American story. Actually, in our reporting, you know, we found out they were inspired by Jimmy Carter. Believe it or not. I mean, they, they took off from, you know, what he tried to do uh, with his sweater and was ridiculed and everything. Yeah. So our reporter, when he was there, the German said to him, uh, why is this so surprising? This is an American story, isn't it? It, it, was, it was quite an interesting... Uh, well, climate change science. Yeah. Much of it nice. is uh, here. Cliff, the Bloomberg Business Week cover that w w David showed yeah. uh, earlier w was significant in that it did galvanize people's attention on this and, okay, let's just say out loud what we're thinking. On the other hand, there are a lot of people for whom no number of Bloomberg Business Week cover right. stories are going to change their minds. And it's also, you know, the, that, that's, that's absolutely true. It's also, I mean, it's to point your finger at the energy industry and oil, even oil companies and say, that's the problem. The problem goes much, is much broader than that, yep. I mean, it, it's it's not, it's 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 not the oil companies are are producing the oil; they're the problem. Well, what about the consumers, and what about our society, and what kind of cars that we drive, and our policies, and 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 and, and we are responsible. All of us, our citizens, are responsible for that. So, the idea of you know demonizing a, you know some companies. Ultimately, the energy companies need to be part of an energy solution, and a solution which is, which has to do with energy security, has to do with sustaining our economy in a sustainable way, yep. um, you know, keeping us out of uh, keeping us out of trouble, all of those things. But it's got to be all of us, not just the not just the oil companies. Cliff, I'm hearing an echo of Rex Tillerson, who earlier this year said. 
it's an engineering problem. So uh, don't Russell, you turn to I'm the not gonna, Well, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 you know, Rex Tillerson, I, I don't know what Rex said, but, you know, whatever. Uh, it's, it's, it's every, but it, if, I, I know that I have members in my family who go on and on about climate change, and then they drive, you know, uh, very inefficient vehicles. That, that, so there's, there's a, there, you know, we need to be writing about that too. And the other, the other point is that um, deforestation is playing a huge role in climate change. Absolutely. And uh, most deforestation is not the responsibility of the fossil fuel industry. Absolutely. Let's take one, maybe one more. Michael, is that okay? Yeah. Ma'am? Right. Let me ask Carl to weigh in on that, Carl. You know, a lot of the stories that get reported on this exist up here, but at the very personal level, many of the things we're talking about have impacts on people's lives. Mm -hmm. Is there an adequate amount of reporting on that aspect of it? Uh, wait, it's, uh, you want my personal opinion as, as, well, as, as a citizen or as a, as a reporter? Or, uh, uh, as a citizen, I think swing that... Swing at whichever ball you want. Yeah, that, but as a citizen, I think that there can't be too many stories about the impact on, uh, on uh, human health. But, um, and I think that as a reporter, it's also, uh, it would sell, um, definitely, yeah, if you can uh, provide your readers with uh, informed stories about um, the impact. I remember just before... Um, you know, it's complicated, but in Europe we have um, elections for the members of the European Parliament. And uh, the last time, uh, one of the French, uh, actually it's the uh, French-German uh, yeah. TV channel, um, they broadcast two days before the election, I think, a documentary about uh, global warming. And it was a very good one. And then the Greens performed very, very, very well two days later, like one of their best scores ever. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is that, yeah, more coverage would probably uh, interest the readers or the viewers or the, the, right. pu the public, and um, yeah. Russell, the reality is that when you humanize any of these big, complicated, mm. scary stories, it does tend to give people motivation to act, mm -hmm. or at least motivation to get, uh, to pay more attention and to get activated, right? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that the, the, this, this, the thing that I struggle with is that when you humanize a story and you find an individual, you're, it's, it's very difficult. You're, you're letting some bias creep in. Whatever right. their personal story is, is going to sort of influence a very complicated... And how universal is it really? Yeah. So it's a struggle. But I mean, absolutely. I, I think it's, it's been sort of journalism 101 for a while that anytime you can take a complicated story and bring a human being, a person into it to show how these decisions that are being made are impacting people, um, you should do it. Always think, a better thing. Yeah. Uh, Professor Weber tells me you all have alcohol waiting. Spe speaking of motivating people to act. Uh, so let's uh, thank our panelists for a great panel. Russell Gold, Clifford Krauss, Carl DeMeyer, and David Sassoon. Thank you all very much. Thanks, that was fun. Thank you. That was fun. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. We can't quite serve you alcohol yet. I've got a couple comments. I've got the responsibility of doing some wrap-up comments to summarize perhaps some of the things we heard today as, a, as the panel sort of wraps up, and then I'll introduce our, our final speaker, uh, Dean Deal from Liberal Arts. First of all, some people ask me, why on earth am I sort of organizing or involved with the conference about France and the USA? A lot, something a lot of you don't realize, I'm a Francophile. I actually lived in Paris in 1986, and believe it or not, was once bilingual. So I once knew French, although I've forgotten all of it. I've replaced that with Texan. And uh, in the summer of 86, when I lived in Paris, I lived right next to the Champs Elysees, right to near the Arc de Triomphe, right, very central part of Paris. And that was the year Greg LeMond won the Tour de France. And we went down to watch the peloton go by. I've never seen a crowd that large in my life. So it was sort of a memorable summer. And there was a Saturday night in the summer of 1986 where it was a full moon, Saturday night, summer solstice. So the city was alive, like you can't imagine, right? Summer solstice with a full moon on a Saturday night. And then France won in the World Cup to go to the semifinals. The World Cup was in Mexico City at the time. So something like 2 a.m., the city came alive honking its horns to celebrate this French victory to make it to the semifinals. I've never seen such a thing. I thought, well, what a great country. We should try to do this, some of that here. So I, I've had this sort of attachment ever since then with France. And a couple takeaways. I guess I've got this other little agenda. I should announce, speaking of bias and all the things we talked about for the last hour and a half. 
we in Texas have this view of the world that we run the energy industry, and we have a very prominent role in the energy industry with Houston and everything else. We have major energy companies based here in Texas. But as hopefully you've learned through the day, France has some very major, important, large energy companies as well, with Total Petrochemical, one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world, GDF Suez, which stands for Gaz de France Suez, uh, the largest electric utility in the world, EDF, Arriva, Alstom, Schlumberger, all these companies that have roots or some presence in France that are very important are larger than some of the companies we think of that run the energy world. So it's good for us as Texans to see that there's maybe more than just Houston. So that's something to keep in mind. And also, I think it speaks to one of the themes coming through that France does large companies very well. Their large companies innovate. In the United States, we look to small companies to innovate. So we are more of a bottom-up sort of corporate structure in the United States, and France has more of a top-down. And the policy coherence operates that way as well. So another comment I would make is that one of the things we heard that France does very well is has policy coherence from a central sort of top-down um, approach that actually is stable over decades or many years. And that's different than the U.S. approach. But you heard from Roger Duncan, the U.S. approach is from the cities up. We actually have really good policy coherence at the local level for many decades. So perhaps we have something to learn from each other because they're not exclusive. We could actually do both. We could have local policy coherence and the central policy coherence, and maybe that would be better. A couple of the things that came out is that we're going through what feels like a game-changing moment or decade or era in the United States with shale gas. We're going through now with shale gas what France went through in the 70s, 80s with nuclear. So France already had its revolutionary game-changing moment and is still reaping the benefits of that. And now we're going through our revolutionary game-changing moment. And we might have had one in the 40s as well, you could say, with, with oil. So we're going through another one of those moments. We're going through what France went through 30 years ago. And the question is, will other countries do something similar? So there's this transition or game-changing moment or game-changing decade going on right now. We also heard through all the panels about regulatory framework, how that's important. The shale gas guy said, we need a good regulatory framework for shale gas. Then the nuclear guy said, we need a good regulatory framework for nuclear. And then you, you heard Jim Sweeney talk about, we need a good regulatory framework for energy efficiency and decoupling and things like that. Then we heard in the policy panel that we need a good regulatory framework for research. And then we need a good regulatory framework for climate goals. So maybe we could conclude that maybe we need a good regulatory framework. And that just ignoring the regulations is not necessarily a huge victory for all of us. We also heard the importance of media and how they can help us uh, communicate and insert the K into fracking, among other things. But more than anything, driving the narrative with the stories that maybe we would miss otherwise, that the narrative is critical. But the media are going through their own transition at the same time our energy industry is going through a transition. So we have a transitioning media industry covering a transitioning energy industry. And so I think we're going to see some changes in how it's reported, what's reported, and how we interpret it. And I think that's some important. And then, I guess, in the end, Roger Duncan has some good advice for us. We need to be careful with our own policy success. We actually might figure it out and have so much success with our policies, we bump into problems we're not quite prepared for with solar, distributed generation, smart grid, you name it, or even with transitioning the media and the energy industry. So that's just a little forewarning for us that there's a lot of good news on the table and on the horizon, but we need to be a little worried about the bad news that we didn't foresee coming. So those are kind of my wrap-up comments of things that came across today that I thought were sort of interesting. I found the whole series of panels and the keynote very educational and fascinating. I hope you did as well. And I want to thank Dean Deal from Liberal Arts for helping to sponsor this conference and welcome up here to make some closing comments. Uh, a lot of people don't realize I'm actually a graduate of the, the College of Liberal Arts at UT as a Plan II alum. And so I'm honored to have him here sort of wrap up the conference. Thank you for your support. And, uh, and then you're the last thing between them and the drinks. Just keep that in mind. So, uh, thank you, Dean Deal. <laughs> The last thing uh, be between me and the drinks. Well, I'll, uh, I will be brief. Uh, uh, let me just say that uh, I want to thank all of you, all of the participants, uh, for coming to Austin to participate in this uh, extraordinary event, uh, which I'm sad to say I only caught the last 15 minutes of, uh, such as the life of an academic administrator. Um, while I'm on that subject, I, I think most academic administrators think that they have a rather tough, challenging jobs. I often whine about uh, how uh, complicated things are uh, as a dean. Uh, I wish I had actually been able to listen to the whole set of panels because I'm pretty sure I would have come away thinking that my life and my work is a walk in the park uh, in comparison to the issues that you're grappling with. Um, you know, when I think of uh, uh, the uh, Fukushima Daiichi uh, disaster, 
you ask the question, can uh, nuclear power be made safe or safer? Um, when you think of uh, uh, climate change, I, I heard a whiff of discussion about uh, climate change in the, in the uh, press section. Uh, this is a tough conundrum. Uh, how do we deal with issues of climate change in a way that uh, doesn't uh, destroy uh, national economies in the, in the process? What about renewables? What about uh, wind? Texas is not only the, the largest uh, oil and gas producing uh, uh, state in the US, it's also the largest wind producing state. But will wind survive? Will it be competitive uh, if uh, subsidies are, are withdrawn? So there are all of these dilemmas and trade-offs and conundra and uh, uh, I just, you know, I'm, I do trust that you made good headway on, on all of these issues today in your discussion. But uh, I, for one, think that the, the right course of action right now is to go for the alcohol. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it at that. Thank you for, for being here.